All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. We've got another one, another good one for you. Today, we're talking about 3D printing materials, ABS, PP, Peak. Are they are there really these resins? I don't know. We're gonna you're gonna have to stick around and find out. Um, but in all seriousness, we're we're talking about how high performance resins stack up against their filament counterparts. And as someone who originally came from a filament 3D printing background, this is something I didn't know a lot about until a year ago when I joined Nexo 3D. So I'm really excited to dive into this one. And I am, so I'm Sean, for those of you who don't know, and I'm joined by our wonderful applications engineer, Mackenzie Hutchinson. Mackenzie, how you doing there? Good. How are you, Sean? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. So I am currently in Wyoming. Mackenzie, you are in? Ventura, California. Cool. At our yes. HU, no less. Um, and yeah, I want to know where everybody is tuning in from for this webinar. So go ahead and drop it in the chat. If you feel like it, maybe we'll give you a shout out. Um, and before I get started with the webinar, got to do a little bit of housekeeping, got to tell you a little bit about Nexa 3D. So we like to say that we're building a sustainable digital supply chain through additive manufacturing. Um, but essentially, we are a manufacturer of 3D printers, and we have a, a full range from the very large powder bed QLS system all the way down to the uh, the nimble zip. So um, a lot of great options for all different applications and levels and industries. Um, and as I mentioned before, we're headquartered in, in Ventura, where Mackenzie is. All of our products are designed and manufactured uh, right there in Ventura. So um, pretty unique, I would say, in the industry, especially for desktop 3D printers. And our 3D printers are used by a diverse group of customers with a common need for speed. So you can just take a look at the logos. I don't really have to go through all of the industries here, but let's just say um, there's a lot of prototyping, but there's actually a surprisingly maybe to me as a, a relatively new resin user, there's a surprising number of people using these for manufacturing and uh, even the resin printers, yes. And that's what we're gonna talk a little bit about today um, with some of these some of these high performance materials. Um, before I move on, I do wanna give a couple of shout outs. Hello, Dale in Orange County, a local resident, gotta stop by our showroom in Ventura. We got Mesa, Arizona, Iowa, Salt Lake City, Oregon. That's actually where I live too. I'm not there now though. Georgia, Iraq, Kentucky, North Carolina, Peru, Germany, Chicago, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, Tampa, Tampa, Ireland, the Netherlands, Serbia, Georgia, Michigan. Thank you guys for joining us from all over the world. Love to see that. Love to see the uh, the reach as our as our nascent brand gets exposed to the world and more people find out about this technology. It's always exciting. Um, all right, hold on. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about our agenda for the day. So, um, depending on how familiar you are with three D printing already. The first section might be a little bit redundant, maybe not. Um, we're gonna give you a quick intro into 3D printing technologies. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about 3D printing materials specifically, and how you might not know about how, how the landscapes evolved and how they came to be where they are. Um, but I think that's kind of interesting. Next, we will talk about how performance resins stack up against filament. I think that's what most people are here to see. So we're gonna talk about some of the testing we've done, some of the testing um, in the in the R and D that has been done for some of these high performance resins, and you know how how they are actually being used, I guess, in the world. Um, and then lastly, 
we are going to touch on just some of our favorite resins um, and some of the printers that we offer um, to not only print these really well, but print them really fast too, because at the end of the day, if you if you take one thing away from Nexa 3D, in addition to us offering a, a range of materials, it's that our printers are some of the fastest that you'll find in the world. So um, it's pretty cool. And um, I see I already see a couple of questions in the Q and A. But if you're so inclined to drop a question in there, um, go ahead and click on that Q and A button or drop it in the chat, and Mackenzie and I will try to answer some of those throughout. Definitely some of those at the end. Um, so yeah, with that, let's let's get into it. All right, so an intro into 3D printing technologies. Again, this might be a review, a repeat for some of you. Um, so filament 3D printing, I, I imagine, I just know this is kind of a fact that there are more users of filament 3D printers in the world than resin. It's the technology that's easier to get started with. Maybe it's people are a little bit hesitant or scared to get into resin because they've never used it. You know, they, they think, what are these resins, these liquids um, versus filament? It just seems cleaner, maybe. But um, as somebody who has done that transition, I can tell you it's not as hard as you think. Um, it's, it's actually, I would say, in a lot of ways, easier than filament 3D printing. But filament 3D printing, with that aside, it was uh, originally patented um, as FDM by Scott Crump back in 1989. Everybody loves to tell this little tidbit. Um, basically how it works is you're taking uh, filament in po polymers or plastics and you're just putting them through an extruder and that extruder is moving around in the X and Y axes while the build plate is lowering or the extruders, I guess, are, are lifting and basically you stack these layers on top of each other, you get a printed object. Simple enough, right? Um, these are some examples of pretty popular 3D printers in the industry. You've got some desktop options in there. You've got uh, industrial as well. So, you know, there's there's a lot of different brands. There are a lot of different makes and models of, of these filament 3D printers. Um, and there, there's a wide um, price range too. Now, resin 3D printing. Um, some people might be surprised to know that resin 3D printing actually came before filament 3D printing. It was actually patented a year before by Chuck Hall, who has went on to found 3D Systems. Um, and he he patented a technology called stereolithography, or as most people call it, SLA. And SLA, um, 3D printing works by taking a vat of resin um, with a build platform and basically curing the resin using this, using this pinpoint laser, drawing out each layer, moving the moving the uh, platform down, drawing another one on top of it and so on and so forth till you have a, a full object. So that's that's kind of the original 3D printing. You actually had the part, you'll notice it, the plate lowers into the vat. So you have, the, you have to have this big vat of resin. Um, and this, this is an example of one of those 3D printers, maybe a more modern 3D systems machine. They still use that. Um, kind of traditional a large vat of resin with the part going down into the vat as it prints. Now compare that to this evolution of resin 3D printers where in the last you know decade or a little bit more, you've seen um, thanks in no small part to some patents expiring with the original SLA patents. And um, you've seen this technology just start to take off, right? So um, first you had this um, you had these desktop 3D printers that that started using inverted SLA. So now you notice the build plate comes up out of the vat instead of going down into it. So now you don't need as much resin. It's more compact. Again, you can fit it on a desktop essentially. Um, and then you have to have this little window for the laser to be able to shine up through and, and cure because you can't just shine through the top of the liquid anymore. Um, you also have DLP technology come out of that. We like we like to say that's the second generation resin technology. So instead of using a pinpoint laser to draw out your object, now you have basically this projector um, DLP, which is 
just the name of general, like a like a movie projector technology that you could buy for your home. Um, it uses a projected light and a chip that it um, you know basically reflects up and it it projects this image that kind of spreads out and covers the full that. And so now you have the ability to print light, you know, an entire layer at once by projecting the source and just flashing it for say 10, 20 seconds, curing, move the build plate, do that again. And then lastly, um, what the most recent technology, or as I like to call it, third gen uh, resin technology, you've got MSLA. And that is actually the basis of the technology that we use at Nexa 3D. So this is instead of using that projector model, um, you're using LEDs and LCD screens. So, you know, I'd say the last two are pretty similar to what you'd find in like your home theater. You either maybe have a projector, maybe you just have an L, you know, 4K TV, right? Um, and instead of you know regular um, visible light, it's printing. You know, it's using closer to a UV spectrum of light, a 405 nanometer to be exact for our printer. Um, but with the MSLA, it's shining basically that full panel straight up. So there's no angles to deal with. Um, you know, so so in some ways it's it's definitely an improvement over the DLP. Also, um the the panels are just more readily available because there's there's so many LCD panels being made around the world and they're advancing to higher and higher resolutions. Um and actually that's that's a a lot of people don't know that's actually a challenge with DLP because you don't have that, those those chips just aren't as popular, but I digress. That is kind of where we are now. So there's been a big evolution in resin 3D printing technology in the last 10 years. Um, these are three, you know, just to put bases to names, these are three examples of the printers you might see in those categories. Um, the one on the right here being our zip. And specifically about ZIP and also our NXE 400. Um, yes, I said these are MSLA 3D printers, but we went one step, a few steps further. I'd say we have some proprietary elements on it. So we, we actually call our technology LSPC. I know, I'm sorry, it's another acronym, but you just got to deal with it because we're a tech company and that's what tech companies do. Um, but LSPC, LSPC stands for um lubricated sub layer layer photo curing technology so um we've got a proprietary membrane that allows the print as it's peeling off the bottom to just be able to peel that much faster than a lot of other printers um we use collimating lens array to make sure that that light is very uniform coming up from that led up through the lcd imaging mask um and yeah, there's just, there's a variety of other, there's anti-aliasing software built in um, to make the parts that much crisper and um, to actually be able to achieve what we call sub-pixel resolution. Um, but, but most of all, like that this evolution to MSLA and, and even beyond to LSPC has led to speed and throughput. So you can see this chart on the bottom that compares some of these technologies. And you can see um, in the same amount of time you could print, um, sorry, with, with just one zip or one LSPC 3D printer, let's say zip for this case, you would need three DLP or, you know, say um, competitive MSLA 3D printers. You would need five to seven SLA 3D printers and you need 12 to 20 FDN 3D printers. So, um, you know, it's a huge, it's a huge difference. And especially I imagine some of this audience coming from that FDM side, curious about what's going on with resin, that speed gain is, is a low key, huge benefit that people I don't think are talking nearly enough about. Um, and that throughput, I mean, if you're thinking about uh, a company with like a team of five engineers, I mean, each engineer could do easily do a print within a day, you know, within the same day, you could have five to eight prints in a day, um, no problem. So everybody can get their projects done. I mean, compare that to some other printers. It's like you get one print per day kind of thing and you're waiting a week to get your print done. So um, it's a game changer. 
Cool. And um, with that little background of the technology, I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic to Mackenzie to talk about 3D printing materials. Thanks, Sean. Um, so yeah, now that you know um, a little bit more about 3D printing technologies and how they have evolved, um, let's look at the same, but for materials. So what materials make the most sense for 3D printing? Um, so a big part of 3D printing are the materials, which have evolved as the technology has evolved. So initially, um, it came from plastics manufacturing, as you can see here with injection molding. Um, and the materials from injection molding were kind of the starting point for FDM. So they followed suit of injection molding, as you can see here, the most common plastics inje injection molding materials. Um, a lot of these were also used for FDM. So it was not a huge jump in terms of material development that was required to move from injection molding to FDM. Um, and that initially kind of gave FDM a leg up over resin printing because it was using uh, previously developed materials. So as you can see here, this is a spool of filament. So this is what's used for FDM printing. Um, the filament is extruded through a hot tip and printed. And this is the type of parts that you would see printed with FDM. Um, but you need to get a little bit more into the realistic aspect of using these materials for 3D printing. Um, it's not always as simple. So if you've printed with FDM printers before, you probably are familiar with this image you're seeing on the right. Uh, so while you're looking for a part on the left, sometimes things don't always go your way. So while the previous list of materials that were shown have great material properties, um, they're not always the most realistic or printable options for FDM. So that's kind of why most people switch to PLA or chosen to use PLA for desktop FDM printers. Um, for industrial FDM printers, they are capable of uh, printing a wider range of materials, but those are substantially more expensive than their F uh, desktop counterparts. So PLA is being used um, because it produces more reliable and consistent parts compared to these other materials um, for FDM. However, there are many drawbacks with PLA. Um, it's not great for finished products. It can have poor material qualities, which are not realistic for industrial or end use applications. Um, in addition to that, it can have a low melting point. So let's say you print a part with PLA on FDM. Um, you happen to leave it in your car on a beautiful sunny day in California, you come back and it's completely deformed. So these aren't really realistic and can kind of narrow the scope um, of what you can do. So that brings us to resin. So resins have been around for a while um, and other manufacturing methods have used resins. Um, so typically with resin, it involves a reaction that brings it from a liquid to a solid. This type of reaction can be done either through heating, chemical reaction and UV reaction. So um, many different industries have used resin in the past such as dentistry, laser printers, et cetera from the 1950s. However, it wasn't really until the 1990s, early 2000s, where resin 3D printing and photo curing resins really came about. So initially, as Sean mentioned, um, so SLA and resin printing was patented. So the material development didn't quite evolve um, that quickly to begin with. So as you see here, these are the initial types of parts that were printed with resin printing. So it was more used for modeling um, and the parts were very delicate. So within the last decade, um, within the patent expiring, uh, resin printing has taken leaps and bounds in improving materials and technology. So with, uh, as Sean mentioned, all the different types of resin printers, such as SLAs, inverted SLAs, DLPs, MSLAs, list goes on, um, entering the market, it really drove resin material development. So this caused Henkel Loctite and BASF, among other material manufacturers, to start paying more attention to resin and developing resins. So uh, as I mentioned, resin printing didn't have that combination of technology and materials. Um, so these companies started collaborating with 3D printing manufacturers, such as us at Nexa 3D, um, to improve on the resin printing. So why performance materials? Why is, does this matter? Why is it necessary? So performance materials lets you broaden the scope of capabilities with resin printing. So as you can see here, these are just a few of the many various applications that you can use with resin printing as the material has developed. So you see jigs and fixtures, 
tools, OEM production parts, replacement parts, aftermarket enhancements, and many more. So how does performance resin stack up against filament? So Nexa 3D and Hankel Loctite have partnered together um, and we are co-developing new materials and have great materials that we have co-developed. So I'm gonna talk about a few of our most popular materials, which have been uh, very useful from an engineering and production standpoint. So the first material I'd like to talk about is our XABS 3842 like material. So this is a familiar and popular material when it comes to injection molding for consumer parts. For example, Legos are made out of ABS. Um, so it's an obvious choice for us to feature as one of our materials. So uh, our ABS technology is not completely identical to that of ABS thermoplastic, but Henkel did a lot of work to make it very comparable in terms of material properties. So as an applications engineer, I recommend this material a lot. Uh, I find it highly printable, easy to use, and also has a great mix of strength and durability. In addition to that, it's one of our uh, materials that is great for outdoor applications because it has great environmental and UV stability. So there are a lot of different applications for ABS. So on this chart, you can see we're comparing some material properties of our ABS to that of FDM and injection molding. Um, and you can see that our elongation at break is significantly greater than that of FDM and injection molding in addition to our impact strength. So this just shows how durable of a material our ABS resin is in comparison to both FDM and even injection molding. Cool. And I'll just take it from there because I snuck in and, and <laughs> for my own self-interest, decided to drop a little clip in there showing what you can, a little fun way to test out the durability of ABS. So let's check out this video. We're out here. I'm ready to smash some stuff. Got my XABS hammer, and I've got the stuff we're gonna smash. Three, two, one. <laughs> Pretty good. Okay, cool. So, um, not the most scientific test of all time but it was a lot of fun and uh, I know we have a few of those hammers sitting around in the office um, so they're they're very strong they're very durable um, and I think I think actually one one thing that I would mention in addition to just the durability is is the strength so um, if you look at that um, that previous slide it showed that the ten tensile strength was somewhere in between the uh, injection molded ABS and the FDM ABS. So with the injection molded being a little bit higher, the FDM being a little bit lower. But um, one thing a lot of people don't know is that uh, resin parts um, tend to be a lot more, almost completely isotrop isotropic. So um, that strength is not just in two axes like in FDM printers. Um, you don't have those kind of weak, weak seams. So you can, see three dimensions of strength essentially which is which is a big deal if for an engineer you don't have to think as much about how you're positioning the part when you're printing it to get kind of that universal strength so um just uh just a quick note there but um so yeah in addition to me smashing stuff with hammers this, this is actually a material that as Mackenzie mentioned is recommended to a lot of our customers. A lot of our customers are using an Alstom. It's actually a case study that I think we just published a week ago. So hot off the press. Um, if you're not familiar with Alstom, it is their their massive train manufacturer. They manufacture locomotives. They manufacture rail cars, and their specialty is really high speed trains. So um, they service so the major rail organizations on six continents around the world. Um, so pretty big deal. And they um, they were looking for a new solution to be able to um, provide a quick turnaround for um, for their customers who are using you know some of their aging fleets. So uh, a rail car can have a lifetime over 30, 30 or 40 years long, I think. And now I think they told me this. I'm not just making this up. But um, 
it can have it can have a decently long lifetime like longer longer than your car for most people's car i would say so um, in that time parts are going to wear down and alstom provides post-sale services to their customers um, so 3d printers allow them to um, basically reverse engineer redesign parts that maybe were manufactured 30 or 40 years ago that they no longer make or they don't have suppliers for anymore um, but they need say 150 parts um, which i think was the case with this specific part that they were printing they need 150 of these foot rests to replace and they were able to turn them around you know very quickly um, you know if you if you thought about um, reverse engineering this creating a new tool a new mold and then injection molding this you're talking about you know maybe maybe a month till you get even get the tool ready to run those molds um, but they can actually print I believe they can print 10 of these parts in in just a few hours so obviously there's there's a huge benefit there in time being able to deliver that so the cost so the uh, rail cars don't need to be down as long they also save a tremendous amount of cost because these are lower volume you know replacement parts so um, yeah pretty cool use of xabs and you know it's 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 a material they picked because it holds up you know they they did a lot of testing and they found that it it it's where characteristics were similar to the parts that had been on there um you know and have kind of failed over 30 years so that's a pretty good sign all right back to you mackenzie Thanks, Sean. Um, so another one of our materials is XPP 405 black. So this is our polypropylene like material. Um, so polypropylene is the most common thermoplastic used in the market today. So it just made sense for us to try to develop a material that matched uh, the characteristics that are found with this polypropylene. So our XPP 405, um, it's a great choice for parts that need impact resistance and a little bit of give. So it still offers great rigidity, but has a little bit more flexibility compared to the ABS material we were just speaking about. Um, so it's great for end use applications um, and parts that are going to be under some type of impact. So as you can see here, um, our ELO, so we offer this material in both clear and black, um, and they both have pretty similar material properties to each other. Um, as you can see, it has 100% elongation at break, so it's giving you a good amount of durability. Um, in addition to that, the impact strength is greater than that of injection molding. So it's a very strong material. How does this, Mackenzie, let me ask you, how does this okay. compare to the XABS? Because I think I always thought these were pretty similar materials. So Yeah, they, I the mean... Other? Totally. So they're both like great performance materials. It just kind of depends the use of the part at the end of the day. So if you're looking for something with more rigidity, less strength, I would recommend ABS. If you're looking for something that is going to be dealing with a lot of impact or you want it to be slightly more durable um, under impact, that's where you'd be choosing XPP 405. So the XPP 405 is going to, it's going to give a little bit more, but it, it won't be as rigid. Yeah, exactly. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, cool. um, back to you again. <laughs> so uh, XP, last but definitely not least, um, this is a powerhouse material for us. Uh, as you can see, it has a very high heat deflection temperature at almost 240 degrees Celsius. Um, so this kind of sets it apart in a league of its own. Um, it's one of our most rigid materials as well. And it's known for great dimensional stability. So you're not going to have to worry about whether like a week after it's printed versus a year after it's printed at warping um, or any other issues like that. So that makes it a great use for end use applications as well as molding. So yes, as you can see here in another chart comparing not just FDM and injection molding, but also powder bed uh, X peak, um, we have the highest heat deflection temperature out of all of them, um, which is definitely something that sets us apart. In addition to that, our Young's modulus is the closest to injection molding out of these options. So we have great rigidity and strength. Right. Yeah, so very, very high heat, very rigid parts. Yes. And I believe now first I need to say 
Um, don't try this at home. We are experts here, experts. Um, we wanted to have a little bit of fun with X-Peak and while it's not a flame retardant material per se, um, I mean, how do you want to test, but with a little bit of fire as well. All right, so in that quick video, you saw two materials. Um, we had a modeling material on one side and the X-Peak on the other side. And like I said, the X-Peak is not flame retardant. I wouldn't recommend like trying to set it on fire, um, but thanks to the high heat properties, it it withstood the, the flame a lot, a lot longer before it kind of, um, I guess, started off gassing and, and it, definitely flamed a lot smaller so you, you can actually see this was that this was the only flame the handle basically caught on fire the rest of it actually didn't catch on fire so the other piece did you know like i said we, we like to have a little bit of fun and test things in fun maybe not so scientific ways but um you know the x peak it's it's definitely um it's definitely a a, a great high temp material and um like i said besides me just setting it on fire it is also a material that is used, um, I would say, most notably by PepsiCo. So they, they've they been doing this freeform injection or these uh, kind of custom injection molds for a while. Um, they've used different technologies over the years, um, but they switched recently in the last year to our NXE 400 3D printer um, because one, it's a lot faster than the printers they had, and two, they really like this X Peak material because it was it could last so much longer. Um, so, if you look at the the big scope of things, they took their tooling time when they were when they just had to machine every single tool out of a solid you know solid metal block into the tool itself. That was about a four week time from design to finished tool, down to forty eight hours. So they they can now take a design print out that insert. I think the inserts take them about, they can print actually, I think six or eight of these on one build plate. So they can print eight inserts so they could do a variety of different molds if they wanted to try different bottle shapes. They can also, um, they can also get over 15,000 shots with this x -Beak. So that was one of the major benefits they found switching to this material from the previous material they were using which I believe only provided a few hundred. So they went from like 300 shots up to 15,000 using this X-Peak material. Um, it allows them to go through multiple design iterations, like I said, um, and also brought their cost, brings their costs way down from $10,000 per mold set down to $350 per, per printed mold. So pretty big deal for them. Um, cool. And that about covers the, the, the main comparisons and the materials um, that I want to do. But we do want to cover a few extra bonus materials that um, because at the end of the day, we're not just a 3D printer company. Um, we are a materials company as well. So um, without the materials catalog, 3D printer is basically useless and, you know, no offense to people printing PLA. I've printed a lot of PLA in my time, but if you're kind of a one material pony like that, you know, you, you might be limited in the applications that you can do. So we have a wide, wide ranging catalog of materials. In addition to the three, the three we talked about, um, I think we have, we're, we have about 30 materials now that are available for our zip and our NXE series. Um, and that includes general purpose engineering resins, a lot of engineering resins, and also some dental resins. But these are a few of our, our other favorites and some of our customer other favorites. So tell me a little bit about these, this, this XCE, Mackenzie. Totally. Um, so XCE is another great industrial resin option in addition to the ones that we have already covered. Um, it has great strength, and I would say it offers probably a little bit less in terms of flexibility compared to that of our polypropylene and ABS-like material. Um, so it is a very rigid material, but is great for end-use applications. 
tool. And we highlighted a couple of those at the bottom of the screen. You can go check these case studies out on our website. Um, but Liquid Sound Technologies, they onshored their manufacturing from Taiwan, where they, they had to bulk order tens of thousands of units to printing it actually on a, a zip desktop 3D printer in the XC. And these are um, guitar accessories that need to that actually attach to the string. So if you think about like the little pegs that the guitar string attaches to, that's what they're printing. And so these, these pieces need to be really strong. They have tensile loads on them for years at a time. So um, they've done the testing and they basically switch from brass parts to these XCE parts. And another customer of ours, Applied Rapid Technologies, similar manufacturing case where they, um, they printed uh, joy, uh, replacement parts for joysticks for these, these boom lifts. Um, and these parts need to basically, you know, sit outside at construction sites. They basically live outside 365 days a year. So heat, cold, UV, the, you know, wetness, they're, they're, uh, they're exposed to it all. Um, and so far they're, they're having a great experience. So, um, that's, you know, definitely, definitely a great manufacturing material right there. All right, tell us about X-Flex. Cool. So we offer a few different flexible materials. Um, we have X-Flex 475 in both black and white, uh, which offers a little bit more flexibility than X-Flex 402. So X-Flex 402 is our stiffer flexible material, um, but has great impact resistance um, and shape memory. While the X-Flex 475 parts, those are definitely more flexible. I don't know if you can... See my screen here? I guess the white is blurring out, but I'll show yeah, you the black. Yeah, the black one shows up. <laughs> so you can see it's very rubber-like material, very durable. Um, it's not like something that's going to shatter and break. So yeah. these are used for many different applications, um, such as like grips. So grips for putters, hand grips, other things. Yeah, and I would say, um, again, for our for our filament using audience, uh, you may be familiar with uh, TP or TPU. Um, this is nothing like that. These are these are way more, I would say, rubbery, silicone-like almost, um, way more durable, because uh, I've printed a lot of that too. Um, those parts tend to be like very kind of plasticky, like almost, um, and like you squeeze it like 10 times and it, it kind of starts to crack at the seams. These parts, I, I would, I would say that most people would be hard pressed to, you know, look at them side by side with a with a molded silicon part, let's say, and pick them up and squeeze them and tell the difference. They're they're that good. So, you know, again, as a former filament user and FDM user, an eye opener to me of of what's kind of possible in the materials world when you uh, when you're using resin systems. Huh. All right, X cool. ceramic. Okay, X ceramic uh, is one of our newer materials that we recently released. Uh, it is very powerful in the sense that it is our quickest printing material at the moment, in addition to being very high heat. So it has a heat deflection temperature of 280 degrees Celsius. Um, so it's greater than that of X peak. It also has a very high tensile modulus, as you can see. So it's very great, like a well-rounded material because it prints fast while still maintaining these great material properties. Yeah. And it's, this one is, this one's a bit of an anomaly because I think when you think of the fastest printing, you kind of, you have your modeling draft mode, resin or whatever. Um, and we traditionally, I think for the longest time, X45, which is one of our quote modeling resins has been our fastest material. I think X ceramic, if I'm not mistaken, has has just surpassed that as being the fastest resin. And when I'm, I'll show you what I mean. We can talk a little bit about what speed means on a on a Nexa 3D printer. But to give you an idea, um, you can print an entire zip build volume with some of these with an X ceramic in about an hour or less. So fill out the entire thing. Um, that's just not normal. Again, where I come from. <laughs> in the in the 3d printing world that i come from so um i uh yeah it's 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 an engineering material that also prints unbelievably fast it's a composite too right a yes. ceramic composite yes, it is. cool 
Um, all right. Cool. Yes. Yeah, so speaking of build volumes, there we go. So I uh, wanted to do a quick highlight of two of our printers because I haven't really talked too much about them. Um, but Zip is our desktop 3D printer. It is uses this LSPC technology. It is open to most of these materials. It's also open material platform. So in addition to that long list of 30 materials that we showed before, um, it you can use third-party materials, which is Again, not always the case for some of these, quote, more professional printers. Um, <clears throat> so this, has, uh, this is a print that we did in our X model 15, um, ran about three hours and five minutes. So not our fastest resin, um, but still pretty, pretty darn fast, right? Like that's an entire build volume um, with, with dozens of parts on it. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, Definitely recommend if you're looking for a desktop 3D printer, maybe an upgrade, checking out Zip because you get this ultra high throughput, you know, high speed 3D printing, but you also get the quality of resin and you get these, some of these properties of these materials that we're talking about. So it's it's kind of a win, win, win. Um, NXE 400 Pro. Mackenzie, I'll let you talk about this one. Cool. Yeah. So our NXE 400 Pro um, is the newest version of our NXE 400 that's released. Um, it's our largest resin resin printer that we have at the moment. Um, so it's great for industrial applications, large build volume. So as you can see here, uh, the build height that it can reach is approximately 15 inches. Um, so it also prints very fast, similarly to that of the zip. Um, it can print layer heights anywhere from 25 to 200 microns. Um, so it's very versatile and it works with all of the materials that we have discussed thus far. Yeah, again, and if you look at the uh, print time here, so there's another full build volume, but now with the NXE, so it's even bigger. Um, and it's using XABS, which I believe is one of our slower material, mm -hmm. like maybe our slowest material. And that still prints in less than 24 hours for an entire densely packed build volume so an 18 hour print you know just mind-boggling speeds i think for for people coming from different technologies that that aren't really used to this um cool um speaking of materials we actually just came out with our brand new 2023 materials guide um you can see all of those materials you can see all the properties um, you can see some of the use cases that we talked about and others. Um, so if you're interested, feel free to uh, go ahead and scan this QR code. Um, you can download the PDF totally free and uh, share it with all your friends. And then with that, I want to get into some Q&A. So please, if you haven't already, go ahead and start dropping uh, questions in for Mackenzie or myself, um, but we already have a bunch, so I'm just gonna get right into it. Um, all right, so MSLA, uh, somebody was asking about MSLA, the light source is an LED array, correct? Correct. That is correct. So it's an LED array, mm -hmm. and like I mentioned before, our printers use 405 nanometer light. So it's technically not UV. It's actually at the very low end of the visible light spectrum. Um, you know, although sometimes we call it UV because it's it's purple, you know, it looks kind of like it. So um all right. I get this is a this is a long one. Um I have an application where I need about 2,000 to 3,000 pieces a year, um, 93 milliliter pieces in volume. The part needs to be pressure tight up to four bar. Okay, this is a very complicated one. So I'm gonna pass this to you, Mackenzie. Okay, let four me- Four bar needs some chemical okay. analysis. Therefore, the material needs to be inert to a wide range of processed chemicals. Is it feasible in, he said SLA, but I'm guessing he means with Nexa 3D technology, which is MSLA. Yes. Plus PC. I think, I mean, overall, I think that is feasible. Um, some of our industrial materials, such as XABS, have great chemical resistance. 
Um, but you would need to be doing this testing on your side to determine whether it fits the specific requirements you're looking for. Cool. Um, all right. What would the lifetime of printed parts in case they, they're exposed to sunshine or UV? Mm -hmm. um, considering the train use case, how long these parts would survive? Um, so I guess, yeah, anecdotally from those customers who I, I both, I interviewed both of them, um, the, the train one, and then you had the, the boom lift one, right? So the boom lift one, that those were actually outside parts, right? Those were elements that were in the, in the cab, an open cab of a boom lift. Um, I've, I've heard that the XC, it does pretty well when it comes to moisture and UV resistance. So I believe, I don't know, Mackenzie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that might be a good choice for like mm -hmm. more outdoor applications. Yeah, I would say XCE or even XABS as well has great UV stability. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and, I, and I'm and i also, I know that there there is a lot of like, people are like, okay, it's, it's UV cured. It, um, do the properties degrade? And there's definitely like a curve, right? I think. I believe there's there's a slight decay of properties and then it kind of plateaus and flattens out so it's not like you're gonna it's not like you're seeing like it continue to cure until it turns to dust it's like it's it you know maybe drops a little bit and then it's like you're you're good for a hundred years i don't know <laughs> <laughs> that hasn't been tested thus so far i have not tested that <laughs> All right, let's start that test today. Um, all right, how do your resins do with scratching? Do they scratch uh, white even though the material is black? That's not something I've seen. I mean, when the parts come off the printer and before they've been post-cured, technically they are still somewhat green and susceptible to scratches that can occur during the cleaning process. Um, but if you're careful with your parts and gentle with them up until they've been post cured, that's not really something you need to worry about. Uh, I also haven't seen scratches of black parts showing up white. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, what is your what is your minimum layer time for the engineering materials? Do you know that? So, like exposure time. Yeah, I think printing time, like per layer. Mm, for industrial materials, I would say, I mean, it can be anywhere for like, let's say ceramic, it's pretty low, like around one second even. Yeah. So it can be anywhere from like one second. Some of our slower materials at low power is probably around 11 seconds. So there's yeah. a wide range. Yeah, so like an XABS. Yeah. You know, XABS, yeah, is probably around like eight to 12 seconds, but you depending can still on the power. And that's like, that's our slowest, but I would say, again, compared to like a lot of other technologies to print a full NXE build volume in 18 yeah. hours, like yeah. unheard of. So mm -hmm. even, even with the slowest set, it's, it's still pretty, still pretty good. That's true. Um, okay. Is X-Peak material approved in any medical uses, body contact or mm -hmm. implant grade versions? Um, so our resins have been tested for cytotoxicity and have passed that basic biocompatibility in terms of contact with skin. Um, some of our materials, such as our dental materials, have passed further biocompatibility um, and would be better suited for uh, medical applications. I believe that ABS might have some a little bit further biocompatibility uh, regulations, but that's something that can be found on the technical data sheet, which is on the website. Cool. Yeah. Also in the materials guide, which I just dropped the link into the chat for some of you asking, who didn't have time to snap up a picture of that QR code. Um, did want to mention, that I just switched the screen here. We do have 3D printed samples. So if you're seriously considering um some of these materials um or i guess our printers and you want to see the part quality we we have these x rook samples and we by default we're going to ship out our x model 15 in which is a gray modeling resin and then our x flex 475 which is mckenzie's favorite material um so you get to 
kind of play around with that, see the print quality that you're getting um, in these parts. I've I've done a live webinar where we've printed third um, where we've printed a full build plate on a zip. So I think we printed like I think it was like eighteen part eighteen of these X rex which are I don't know maybe like three four inches tall, maybe three inches tall in about thirty minutes. So um, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty cool. Uh, definitely recommend getting one of those X rex sample packs if if you're looking though. Um, do you have any carbon fiber versions of materials? How is carbon fiber implemented into resins? So we do not have any carbon fiber composite materials at the moment. Um, that's not something that we offer within our current material selection. Uh, but as Sean mentioned, our printers are open source and open platform. So if you found a carbon material that worked at 405 nanometers, um, that's something that you could try. All right. Um, but yeah, the, the ceramic one is, I think that's, is that our first composite material? I think so. Yeah. So, you know, possibly on the horizon, some more exciting composites mm -hmm. that we're adding in. Um, let's see. Another question kind of about how, how to prevent printed parts from continuously um, degrading, I guess, under UV. I think mm -hmm. we kind of already covered that. Um, are there any food safe materials? There are not any food safe materials. Uh, we have not done testing on our prints to see if that is the case. If someone wanted an injection mold quality material, what would be the best material to use with your um, what would be, yeah, the best material to use, uh, surface quality and accuracy specifically? Um, so a lot of our industrial materials can be used for parts that were previously injection molded. It basically depends on the application of the part um, and how you want to kind of work with the material properties. In terms of nice surface finish, uh, Peak is always really nice and has great dimensional accuracy. Cool. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually curious myself, like, cause we have all the, we have modeling materials mm -hmm. and then we have some other. So is there like a benefit visibly for like a modeling material? Like do they print at a higher resolution in some cases? Yeah. Um, get the same pretty much from engineering yeah, materials. Totally. So all of our industrial materials and modeling materials print at 100 micron layer height. If you're looking for finer resolution, you could go down to 50 microns and develop exposure settings from there. Uh, modeling materials don't quite have the material capabilities that the industrial materials have, but they're known for looking very nice with their surface finish and dimensional accuracy. So if that's what you're looking for, we also offer more colors. So like X model 15, for example, um, you have black, white, and gray. So you have a little bit more options with that. Nice. Um, do you develop chemical resistance charts for your materials regarding X peak resin? Does it have the same chemical resistance of pure peak? That's a great question. Um, we don't develop our own chemical test. That's something that we get from the resin manufacturer. So that can be found either within our website on the technical data sheet for Peak or within the resin manufacturer's website. I would say it's probably not going to have the exact chemical yeah. properties of Peak. Um, it's more of a it's more of a mechanical property analog, less so a chemical property analog. So um, you know they're they're definitely totally different polymers, I guess. Yeah. Um, between X35 and XABS, what is the difference? Because print time is two times plus for ABS. Is X35 comparable to XABS? Yeah. So X model 35 is definitely a faster printing material. Um, I would say it's the most comparable probably to XCE in terms of material characteristics. So it is very rigid and tough but it doesn't really have the durability or elongation that ABS has. Cool. Um, somebody asked about carbon. They said 
they noted that carbon has a limitation with solid part with large solid parts mm -hmm. um, items. Uh, so they mostly print ho hollow parts mm -hmm. or latticed parts. They're they're pretty totally. famous for showing those. Um, and how how does that compare with Nexa? Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be a challenge with printing large solid parts due to the large cross section that you get um, when that happens. We have a few options within our Nexa X software, which is our proprietary build preparation and slicing software that we use to prep our builds. Um, with that, I mean, we have a hollowing and latticing feature within that. But if you were looking to print a large solid part, we also have a large solid part enhancement. So yeah. you have a few different inputs that you can do with that. But basically what it does is for each layer where there's very large cross section, it's going to expose and cure a uh, boundary and then the inside of the uh, cross section separately. So that'll help you print larger solid body parts. Yeah, and I think further to that point um, on the technology side, I know I've talked to our CTO Azar about this a little bit, and there is a there is actually a severe limitation on the carbon side because of the you know they rely on an oxygen permeable membrane. So when you print something really solid, it actually sucks more oxygen up, which in which inhibits curing. So um, you know while it's always going to be a bit of a challenge. Uh, you know, we're, we're con I'd say most of the parts we print are, or I've printed at least are solid. Like mm -hmm. when you compare that to like FDM or carbon, like FDM, a lot of times default is like a 10% infill, right? So you don't print solid, but most of the things with this by default are just going to print solid. Um, you know, even if it's not like a huge, you know, solid rec, you know, cube, but you know, the, like the bodies will be solid, the, the watertight aspects will all be solid. So um, they can they can generally theoretically handle it, I guess. <laughs> um, is there a bigger Nexa 3D printer in the works? I'd like to see a 500 cubed, <laughs> about cube, yeah, 500 cubic millimeter at least. I love the enthusiasm. Yes. Well, we'll make sure to pass that note along to the product team. Everybody loves big build volumes. Uh, let's see, we, we're, we're rolling. We got a lot of questions here. Can I use the ceramic material for RF applications? Thanks for all the questions, by the way, guys. Um, that's not something we've tested out. So uh, that's kind of an unknown at the moment, but it would definitely be something worth trying. Yeah, and I would yeah. I would say Mackenzie and her team, um, they're they work with a lot of these customers. Like some of these case mm -hmm. studies we showed, they've you know they've they've helped like validate. So if you have like a, a really legit application for this, and you have these questions, and you want you know you want to talk to somebody, um, that is an option. You just have to basically. Get in, get in touch with our sales team, you know, talk, you know, talk about what you're looking to do. And then, you know, if, if that, if that kind of seems like it makes sense, you'll probably get, you know, in touch with Mackenzie at some point and she'll, she may, she may print a benchmark for you and, and you can do the testing yourself. So um, that is definitely a service that we offer. Mm -hmm. Try before you buy. Exactly. <laughs> um cool thank you thank you no thank you guys for attending um could you give a general sense of how to decide between the x pro 410 and x model materials um i mean they're both great materials i think it comes down to what you're looking for with material properties that's typically how i decide which material to move forward with um depending on the application but you can't really go wrong with either material in this sense. So some print faster than others, um, but they're pretty similar in terms of modeling aspects. Cool. Okay. Um, material catalog is also interested if it can be shared. Um, yeah, that is actually 
that is actually one of the last pages in that material guide. So again, drop the link in the chat. Uh, you can download it and get that material, that full material catalog with all the specs and everything on it, all the properties. Cool. Um, what's the thinnest line the LCDs can draw? So I guess like the pixel size uh -huh. is the question. Okay, um, let's see what is it. So for zip, the pixel size I think is around 52 microns. So that would be the smallest. And then for the NXC, I think it's around 76 microns. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there's, I'm not entirely sure what this, but I know there is some element of the anti-aliasing that allows further refinement from, from there on out. So I guess maybe that's more of a factor of smoothing out so you don't okay. get these like stair-stepping layer lines, but it basically involves dimming the edge pixels down to 75 percent 50 percent 25 percent of their of their intensity to basically smooth out the surface so i don't think that's like i think that's a technology that has or been around a long time for regular printers but pretty cool technology and sorry for saying cool so much i saw i saw some comments on that <laughs> All right. Um, wow. Look how the time flies. We are two minutes over. <laughs> I'm so sorry that we, we've got probably like 20 more questions that we didn't even get to. Um, but thank you again, everybody for joining. Um, this was a fun one. Thank you, Mackenzie, for, for making some time for us. Of course. Happy to be here. Cool. And yeah, if you guys have any questions, um, you know, go to our website next to 3d.com. You can get in a conversation with a sales rep and, you know, they won't, they won't high pressure you into, into buying. They just want to, you know, make sure if you have an application that makes sense that, you know, that if we have a solution for it and if we have a material for it and maybe, who knows, maybe you'll get to work with Mackenzie too. Um, so with that, again, um, we'll send this recording out to everybody who wants to share it or recap it and... Happy printing. We'll see you next time.